Good morning. So I think that we can start our first panel. I uh, give the floor to Professor Mikolaj Morze. Yes, uh, thank you uh, and welcome everyone. Welcome to this first panel devoted to machine learning. Um, we have two exceptional speakers and the main goal of this panel is to identify ways in which uh, the project can leverage the new developments in machine learning and uh, in natural language processing in particular. Our first speaker is Dr. Łukasz Kobyliński from the Institute of Computing Science of uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. He is one of the most recognized specialists in computational linguistics. He is the member of the largest uh, uh, NLP project uh, currently executed in Poland, Clarin PL. He is the developer of tools uh, for Polish language modeling within a very uh, popular spacey library. And he is one of the organizers of the Paul Evel uh, Data Challenge, uh, which is the part of the larger uh, family of challenges uh, that aim uh, to the development of, of computational linguistics and, uh, and NLP tools. And he is also the host of the Stacja IT podcast, something that uh, I personally, as a person who is literally addicted to podcasts, uh, appreciate very much. So please welcome Dr. Kubiński. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction and, and for the invita invitation for this um, uh, conference. Uh, let me just uh, take a moment to start the presentation. Okay, so <clears throat> the title of my uh, presentation is uh, Am I Talking to a Human? And by that I would like to immediately start the discussion um, about the state of the art in, in NLP in 2020. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the discussion is uh, whether it is now the, the time that we actually ask uh, ourselves uh, this, this question when we uh, interact with, uh, with machines. Uh, and if so, uh, why and how has the situation uh, changed in, in, in research, uh, recent years? So um, to start the discussion, let's have, uh, first uh, have a quick look at the historical background on, on NLP. Uh, we have been actually working on NLP since at least uh, 1950s. But what I want to show uh, by this uh, slide is um, how the approach to NLP research has uh, has changed rather quickly uh, through the years. So um, one of the the, the first uh, approaches that was um, applied to NLP was based on uh, on statistics. So this is illustrated by the saying of John Rupert Firth from from the 1950s: "You shall know a word by the company it keeps." So the idea was that um, we need to look at the text itself, uh, at, uh, at language itself, and from that language we will discover Im important um, knowledge, important relationships, and um, applying statistical machine learning methods is, is the way to go. But then um, came so-called AI uh, winter in, in 1970s, um, publications by Minsky and Puppert were published where, where they um, criticized or criticized or or have uh, shown um, uh, limitations of, of neural networks. Uh, there were publications by Chomsky who criticized this, this statistical approach to, to NLP. And basically, uh, most of, of AI research um, has, has been stopped by, by uh, stopping funding and um, most research concentrated on applying um, expert uh, linguistic knowledge uh, to, to, um, to processing language. So uh, people concentrated on creating, creating grammars, uh, rules, um, dictionaries, and um, this was supposed to, to give better results than this, this previous statistical approach. But then things changed again in, in 1990s, where more data was, uh, was available, more processing power was available, 
And it turned out that these old statistical approaches and, and machine learning approaches are starting to give um, better and better results. And um, here for the, for the illustration, we have a, a quote from Fred Jelinek who worked on machine um, translation, uh, who said that uh, uh, anytime a linguist uh, leaves the group, the recognition rate uh, goes up. So, so this illustrates this, this change in, um, in, in the approach that was applied then, that uh, we don't need this expert knowledge. We are relying more and more on, on, on statistics and on, on the, the language it, itself. So looking at these dates, we may ask ourselves, uh, ourselves um, uh, and we asked ourselves in, in 2010, are we going back to, to the linguistic approach in, in, in this 2010? Because the, this, this would um, uh, be more the, the most obvious uh, uh, trend here that we are going uh, back and forth uh, between this uh, statistical and linguistic approach to NLP. Uh, are we uh, achieving some, some kind of... Um, uh, 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 situation in in which we uh, cannot rely on machine learning alone, and we need those the, this this linguistic uh, knowledge again to uh, to move forward. But then came um, various new developments about uh, which I would like to to talk uh, today, and uh, most obviously uh, deep learning, and and this change. The, the situation in, in the way we are still um, involved mostly in, in uh, machine learning and artificial in intelligence when we are talking about natural language processing. So let's discuss what are the uh, most important developments in the 21st century that, uh, that really uh, moved the national, natural language processing forward and um, uh, created the situation in, in which we rely on artificial intelligence in, in this uh, area. So in my opinion, there, there are four pillars of, of this situation. The first are the algorithms. So uh, we have the right tools to, to efficiently uh, model the data, uh, to, to discover knowledge from the data, and of course, these, these algorithms are all not, not at all completely new, but they are um, um, optimized, they are uh, created with these uh, large amounts of data that we, that we cope with today to, uh, to actually efficiently uh, mine and discover knowledge from, 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 from language. Uh, the, the second pillar is, is uh, the, uh, the big data trend or, or revolution. Uh, the, the idea that uh, we have so much data available now coming from various sources, from, from the internet, from internet of things, from our phones, um, uh, that uh, uh, this enormous amounts of, of linguistic data give us more knowledge than ever before. Next, uh, third uh, pillar is, is the available processing power. So we actually have um, um, processing power to, uh, to discover knowledge in the data. Uh, we can utilize cloud infrastructure. We can uh, use new processing architectures to, um, uh, to transform the data. And we are able to process this data in, in reasonable time. And the fourth pillar is, is the need, uh, that is the, the business need um, in, um, uh, for uh, NLP um, methods and um, uh, NLP um, uh, applications that really change the, the, the world and, and the business world and, and services that we use uh, every day. So, uh, discussing in a little bit detail uh, these uh, four, uh, four pillars, I would like to start with the algorithms and I don't want to get into very much technical detail here, but just to give the, the intuition what has changed in, in the recent years. Uh, let's stop for a moment uh, looking how um, does the machine see written language? How, how do we represent uh, text when we want to process it, to transform it, to, to uh, mine some knowledge from it? So what we have done uh, just 10 or 15 years ago, most commonly, 
was to use the so-called bag of words representation. So we just would um, um, count the words that, that were um, in, in a particular text and using uh, such a simple uh, frequency lists and, and, and bags of words, we would fit them to, to algorithms to, to classify them, to uh, segment them, and, and so on and so on. This, this representation is uh, very primitive, and uh, as you may um, uh, assume, it, it, it gives very, uh, a large number of problems uh, related to um, ambiguity, to uh, to the to, to lack of of se semantic information in, in in this representation. And what has changed in in recent years is the the approach that that we now uh, uh, seem to um, uh, to apply the most often. Is, is and it is uh, uh, actually a comeback to the to the saying of of John Rupert Firth in the 1950s. So we are coming back to this idea that we will know a word by the company it keeps, and we actually are doing it uh, uh, in in NLP. So what we are doing now is is actually we are looking at the words um, and we are looking at the particular window around the words, looking at other words that that appear in a, in a similar context. So here and um, shown in green is is the word it in a movie review, and the word it uh, appears in in contexts of of other words such as uh, movie in in yellow fun, recommend, seen, see, seen. And if we, um, if we have enough, uh, a big enough uh, corpus of, of such movie reviews, that it will um, soon appear that this word it in, in, uh, so, um, in this kind of reviews is, um, is appearing in similar context than, um, uh, than the word movie. So we may say that the representation of the word it is similar to, to the word movie because, because it appears in similar contexts. And this, this intuition uh, used in, in the real world uh, mathematical representations leads to a very interesting um, thing. It, uh, it appears that um, the semantic uh, relationships between words um, translate to the space of mathematical space of word representations. So if we know that there is a relationship between man and woman um, in, in the real world, uh, that is the, the change of, of the gender, uh, that the same relationship holds in the mathematical space of word representations. So we can then uh, somehow calculate uh, new words, find words which um, hold the same relationship that uh, uh, than, than other pair of words. For example, if we uh, are interested in a relationship similar to um, the re relationship between king and kings, we can ask the the, re the representation what is the equivalent word um, holding this relationship for the word queen and the representation re responds with the, with, with the word queens. And this is really incredible and, and also um, uh, something magical even happens when we um, ask these representations for other types of relationships. And it, it appears it, uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, um, a grammatical relationship. It can be a real world um, analogy, um, for example, between um, countries and, and their capitals, um, uh, between um, uh, people and their roles. Uh, so, so we can, uh, given the, the relationship between France and Paris, we can ask the, the representation, what is the equivalent word for Italy? And it responds with the word Rome. Or we can ask about um, Einstein being a scientist, and we get that Messi is a midfielder. So this is this is really magical, and um, and it turned out to be a very important um, milestone in in NLP research in in, in research in recent years. But what we can ask ourselves is uh, how is it possible? 
uh, is this algorithm so incredibly uh, intelligent? Well, uh, the algorithm is, is actually not that new, but what has changed is that um, uh, uh, the, num the uh, quantity of data that we are able to process uh, today is vastly uh, higher than what we could do in, in 1950s or even 1990s. So uh, our, our, our algorithm knows these relationships because these relationships are in the data. And we, if we have enough data, we can find it automatically. And this is this uh, second pillar of, of this uh, NLP revolution in, in recent years, uh, big data, which, which allowed us to uh, collect and, and, and process uh, vast, amount of, vast amounts of data. Uh, this illustrated here by the uh, total size of Wikipedia uh, article text in, in gigabytes or the size of uh, um, crawls, uh, common crawls of, of, of the internet, the number of web pages that, that this common crawl project collects, downloads from the internet. Having these amounts of, of data allows us to uh, find those relationships that are hidden in the in the language itself in the text itself similarly as as a human as a child le learns um, each year by by reading and, and hearing um, language but uh, the third pillar is, is also necessary this um, processing power so uh, so we can actually perform calculations on on petabytes of um, of data one change, of course, was uh, was the change in algorithms and in, in calculation tricks, but actually new processing architectures such as GPU and, and TPU allowed us to um, use much larger neural networks that when that were used in, in 1950s that were criticized by uh, by Minsky and Papert. And also we just have uh, much more raw processing power using, for example, a, a cloud infrastructure. And then this allows us to, uh, to use this um, not, uh, not that new um, um, approaches to um, petabytes of, of, uh, of text. And finally, uh, the fourth pillar is, is this business new the business need. So um, yeah, natural language processing is not longer tied to, to academia research uh, anymore. Uh, NLP is a core technology for, for enabling many products and, and services of today. And uh, this research is conducted uh, uh, in, in many privately held uh, companies uh, that moves this, this research uh, forward faster than ever before. And the financing is, is much, much higher. One of the examples uh, that you may uh, know from everyday life is, is, um, are, are these uh, so-called um, uh, voice assistants, uh, either uh, on your phone or as a standalone device. So um, as you probably know, these assistants are created uh, both uh, by um, Google and Amazon, but also on your phone by, by Samsung and many other companies. So uh, and and this uh, this application is um, uh, is an example of of um, uh, um, this progress in in NLP that uh, uh, that was made in research recent years by uh, solving so many NLP tasks in in one device because the voice assistant um, solves. Um, at least the problem of voice recognition so so you can uh, actually and the machine can actually uh, transform your voice in, into into text uh, it solves the problem of um, of a chatbot so when you um, talk to it uh, the uh, the machine understands um, your intention and the objects that you are talking about it solves the problem of question answering so when you ask it a question it uh, it, re it responds and many many other problems just in one device uh, that had to be solved for this device to be successful and uh, um, uh, talking about this example for a, for a moment, I would like to uh, focus on on um, on these NLP problems. So, 
one uh, one pro problem mentioned is is the the problem of um, of a dialogue agent so a commonly uh, called uh, a chatbot that you may know from from web pages or or this voice assistance so the idea is that uh, uh, we uh, talk with uh, with uh, with a chatbot like with a regular person and um, uh, and the answers are generated based on on our um, on our questions. Uh, there is uh, the, the, this, um, there is a memory of the dialogue. There is a, a state of the dialogue. So the machine uh, knows the context and knows what it has been asked before to to generate new new responses. And this was all possible thanks to um, advanced language modeling that is uh, um, that is taking place nowadays. Uh, the, uh, so we are able to uh, get these large amounts of data, these petabytes of data, and create create language models, uh, which um, uh, extract this this knowledge about about language itself. And um, uh, various uh, additional processing uh, steps that that allow us to uh, discover the the intents of uh, um, uh, of a person that is using the chatbot, the entities that are being related to the context, and performing actions that are um, requested by the user. And this uh, uh, this example of, of a chatbot or an uh, voice assistant also brings us to the problem of, of previously mentioned question answering. This is another problem that is um, quite well um, being solved uh, right now by various uh, also commercial services. Here is the example of um, of the Google search engine when where you can just ask when was Lincoln born. And uh, this search engine will correctly identify that you are talking about Abraham Lincoln and, and show his, his photograph. It will correctly um, find the answer to your question and, and print it in large letters here. And also uh, come up with, uh, with other related questions. So th this is a uh, um, uh, step... Um, uh, in, uh, this is the, the more specific uh, NLP task that needs to be solved um, uh, for those voice assistants to, to be working. But still, we have a lot of uh, smaller prob problems that had to be solved for this question answering to, to be working correctly. So we have the, the problem of... Um, named MTT recognition, uh, the, the, the problem how to identify that Lincoln is a person and it, it, it is Abraham Lincoln, uh, the problem of um, analyzing the structure of, of the sentence and identifying that uh, we are actually talking about um, the time of, um, uh, of birth of Abraham Lincoln. And the problem of extracting information from from various sources, uh, probably from Wikipedia and other uh, web uh, sources, and um, uh, finding in in long strips of of text that uh, that the actual birth date of Abraham Lincoln was um, uh, February twelfth. So this is all um, very interesting. Um, but the, 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 the example that is probably um, more related to, to, to the topic of this conference um, is an example of automatic cyberbullying detection. So this is one of the tasks that, uh, that were organized um, uh, during the uh, Poleva competition that was already um, uh, mentioned in the, in the introduction. So in, the, in, in 2019, we had this uh, task of, of recognizing um, cyber bullying on the internet and um, a training data containing examples of, of such cyber bullying was, was presented to, uh, to participants of the competition, uh, such as um, annotated examples of disclosures of uh, private information, personal attacks, threats, blackmailing, ridiculing, gossiping, and so on and so on. And the, the task of the participants was to come up with uh, with the algorithm and method, the model that that would uh, automatically uh, identify such examples, and annotate them in in particular categories, 
and it turned out that it um, went uh, fairly well. We had um, a very um, large interest in the task, um, and um, the, the result were, results were very promising and further enhanced by even newer models, um, these uh, so-called language models um, yeah, that are being developed still and are being evaluated on this data set uh, denoted here as CBD where we have um, an accuracy of, of um, over 70% of, of identifying such, um, such mentions of cyberbullying in, uh, in, in, in an unstructured text. So this is, um, this is very promising. And uh, one of the hot topics uh, in NLP is, so of course, uh, langu natural language uh, generation. Um, yeah, this is uh, even uh, uh, even more known now as um, this open AI group announced that uh, one of the uh, language models that they developed, namely GPT-3, um, is, um, is so advanced that it's too dangerous to humanity to, to actually release it. This is, of course, uh, uh, somewhat a, a publicity stunt, but actually... Um, these models are, are really getting better and better and um, are trained on more data. So you can um, probably uh, um, test them yourself on the internet just, just uh, looking for GPT-2 uh, or GPT-3 and, um, and it will complete your uh, sentence uh, just by uh, looking at uh, statistical probabilities in the language model. And this, this example is, um, is of course, um, uh, wrong. So uh, we are asking the model um, somehow where uh, was uh, Lincoln born, asking it to complete the sentence Lincoln was born in, and the predictions are in, in Germany. And that is uh, no, because um, yeah, this, this, uh, this test is made on, on an older GPT-2 model and um, a smaller data set um, but also this model is, is actually uh, not trained uh, for question answering, but, but rather for, um, for continuing um, sentence that, that were provided by the user. And these, uh, th these um, examples of, of NLP applications uh, are, um, are appearing in more and more uh, uh, business uh, applications and, and academia uh, related projects. We could discuss them um, in, um, um, uh, in, in, in large quantities. But one uh, important uh, application that I would like, uh, I would like to uh, point to is also um, uh, the uh, combination of um, uh, um, image recognition and natural language processing. So what, what we can do now is, is also combine those methods that are, were developed for image recognition and train models that are able to automatically label and, and even describe um, images, photographs, uh, that are able to, to describe the situation uh, that is um, not only the, the objects, but, but also uh, the, the situation that is taking place on, on, an, on a photograph. And this is also a very uh, important application that, that allows, for example, uh, creating documents that are um, readable by, uh, by people with disabilities. And this is one of the projects that I'm working on uh, right now. So in conclusion, uh, NLP has, has uh, come a long way um, to, to this date, but the, just the recent years um, uh, had the great share in, in this revolution uh, based on those um, four pillars of, of algorithms, of um, available processing power and available data and, and the business need that that, um, that it drive that is the driving force of of um, of this um, um, of this work on on nlp thank you very much nikolai you need to Uh, hello, uh, Mimiko, you have to unmute yourself.
sorry. Uh, we will. Uh... Hello. Is there a problem with my? Yes, no, we can hear. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, our second speaker is Janis Gajski, a graduate of Poznan University of Technology and machine learning practitioner uh, and entrepreneur who started a very successful startup in the highly competitive area of automatic speech recognition and spoken language understanding. And prior to that, he has been developing a startup focused on effective, uh, effective uh, recommender systems and leveraging human emotions and affective states. And I have a hunch that uh, his newest enterprise, something that he is working on right now, is going back to this uh, very human-centered machine learning, and that this is the main reason he's very interested in collaboration with our project. So, Jan, please uh, take the screen. Hello, hi. Um, so, uh, let me just share the screen and and get this party rolling. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so just a little bit um, additional information about me is um, so, as we guys said, I'm an uh, entrepreneur and I'm hopefully turned social entrepreneur. So, um, so my, my ne next business uh, or next. Um, enterprise is going to focus on um, on uh, culture design through platforms for personal growth. Um, I specialize in machine learning. I am a published scientific author. And I'm also an avid practitioner of lateral thinking and interdisciplinary analysis. And this is um, basically the angle which I want to uh, take uh, in that talk. Uh, so I want to be um, I want to traverse multiple domains uh, to hopefully create a more holistic understanding um, of uh, the problem of misinformation and the influence of um, kind of adversary social network interactions on society and individuals. Um, so in that talk, uh, I would like to challenge some uh, uh, in-the-box thinking that, pop that is popular in the subject of fake news uh, and misinformation. Um, I'd like to make a case for complex systems modes of thinking. Um, so saying that they're really important and actually quite indispensable tools uh, in the effort of uh, web immunization and in general in other efforts efforts of positive social change. Um, and um, having introduced that notion of complex systems, I would like to advertise uh, a couple of useful frameworks, both as established and bleeding edge, that explore a modality, uh, this modality of complex systems for applicable understanding and design of effective interventions in complex systems. Um, then I'm going to go a little bit uh, interdisciplinary um, and introduce a modern definition of trauma uh, as a useful lens through which to view the human condition to understand behavior uh, and understand the sources of harmful behavior. Um, and in general, um, understand possible interventions that are more than firefighting, that are more uh, uh, long-term. Uh, and uh, then drawing on these, um, uh, these examples from complex systems, I would like to kind of make a case for um, investigating the techniques employed in therapy and personal growth as possible cyber vaccine. So um, trying to convince, um, uh, convince the, 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 the listener that they could possibly quite effectively reduce harm from misinformation. Um, and um, lastly, I would like to kind of provide some inspiration of using software and AI uh, in making those treatments scalable and cost-effective and um, a sketch, kind of a field study that could be done within the web immunization grant or this, uh, this, this, this general endeavor that we have here uh, committed to. 
And just a disclaimer, I might be wrong about all of this. Uh, I'm kind of taking the liberty of the courage to be wrong. Um, but this panel is about idea generation. So I hope that's okay. And time is short and the subject is broad. Um, so the depth will be limited. Uh, so feel invited to reach out to me for additional information on the things that have been touched on during this um, um, this talk. And there are also going to be some bibliog bibliography at the end where you can actually reach to the sources that have inspired some of the thoughts in this um, in this presentation. Um, so. Let's start with the challenging. Let's start with being outrageous and basically uh, probably not being liked by the other panelists. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's gonna be fun. Uh, so, so I think uh, I've identified three very important um, box types uh, that are um, often inhibiting um, effective work with complex systems uh, and the society and the humans are complex systems. Um, and I wanna give some examples for each of those. So we have uh, a focus on symptom versus cause. Um, we have a focus on pathology and firefighting. And we have reductionism where we try to really, we. Um, out of fear of complexity, we really limit um, the field of study to a very narrow uh, part of the system, which um, oftentimes results in uh, reduced uh, predictive capability uh, and reduced uh, quality of interventions. So uh, first focus on symptoms versus cause. Um, um, let's see on examples, um, the first box, we're going to talk on uh, anger. So we can, for example, create an assumption box uh, where anger in social media should be suppressed because it threatens the civil society and stability of our institutions. Um, but if we kind of go deeper and unpack anger a little more, uh, we see that this is a prim primary emotion of protecting oneself. Uh, and Psychologists uh, say that there are multiple modes of anger and some of them are very healthy. Um, so anger, uh, according to jo uh, Jordan B. Pe Peterson, can be an immature reaction to an overwhelming uh, situation, but can also be a necessary reaction to tyranny. So, so a very adaptive emotion, a very important emotion. Um, so now we can have a look at uh, what kind of prison bars does this box create? And we can see that by suppressing anger, we risk, risk uh, censorship or authoritarian regime where grassroots change is impossible. So we, we kind of uh, create a dystopia by trying to help and alleviate an existing problem. Uh, and how do we step outside the box? And these are going to be in this format here, usually questions that we can ask ourselves to kind of broaden our understanding of the issue. So, so, in, so we can ask, for example, how we can help ourselves to mature uh, so we are less overwhelmed, thus reducing those immature reactions. Or how we can help ourselves to be aware of our anger and see the real drivers. So our anger cannot be hijacked by an outside um, agency. Uh, or we can also ask what tyranny do we or the people oppose and can we find constructively, uh, uh, find ways to constructively enlisting that energy of anger into meaningful change. Um, so that's anger and similarly, um, distrust distrust um, um, and we can say, okay, there's a lot of uh, mistrust caused by social media um, uh, and there are all these conspiracy th theories and all those kind of misinformation uh, just circulating around. So we need to teach people to trust in the authority of science and institutions. Um, and how do we best do it, right? So that's the box. 
Uh, but when we unpack this trust, when we go deeper uh, into how it functions in the complex system, um, so it can be a result of a cognitive bias of unresolved developmental issues or traumatic events, and that becomes not distrust by, but mistrust. We, we just place our trust um, in, improperly um, and can be a false dichotomy wrongly generalized from experience. So kind of I have been mistreated once, everyone must be evil, um, but can be an adaptive reaction to an entity or system that has violated us repeatedly. I don't trust this person because two times he cheated me, right? Or I don't trust this uh, institution because it has provided um, improper information on multiple occasions, right? Um, so distrust uh, is an essential component of creative and balanced cooperation. Um, so now that we unpacked it, we can see the prison bars and we can see um, the risk of a sunken cost fallacy when propagating a falsified narrative uh, through a trusted source becomes an imperative, a kind of an end uh, in itself out of the fear of compromising the, believ the believability of the source itself. So once a public agency kind of tweets um, a particular science fact that then is debunked, it might be prompt to continue this line of reasoning out of the fear of um, losing this credibility, right? This currency in the information entrepreneurship, right? And this is very dangerous. Um, we can see, you know, that leads to censorship or alienation of affected groups. Like we just push them away because they're mistrust. Uh, so, um, so we kind of close them in their, their own segment and just, just push them away, right? Um, but it can also disable the skeptics and nonconformists who are essential agents of so societal evolution, right? There is, uh, you know, most of innovation comes from those who disagree with the status quo, right? Mistrust the status quo. Um, so what do we do to step outside? Um, uh, so what is the reality of people who mistrust, right? Is, this, is it generated by another non-adaptive process, right? Could it be caused by anxiety or hypervigilance that all result from, from trauma? Um, uh, how can this process be amended, this generating process, not the symptom, right? Um, what's, and also we can ask, what systems have perpetually violated trust? Um, um, and how coercion has become a societal norm uh, because of marketing and kind of post-truth politics. Um, you know, mistrust may be a natural reaction to a culture of coercion, right? Um, and how those drivers can be amended and put in check so we can restore healthy trust, right? Um, how we can educate ourselves about healthy trust and distrust um, and how we can have distributed agency, right? So these are some of the questions to step outside the box. So now we go into pathology and firefighting. Um, so an example how this kind of mod modality of thinking can cause um, and put us in the box is um, we should find uh, uh, ways to spot super trolls and super spreaders and disable them, right? So we find those who, you know, share a misinformation to, in a direct message to uh, 100,000 people, right? Or, 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 or 50 of their friends, right? But if we look deeper in the box, if we look to unpack this, is like uh, super spreaders are usually a minority uh, given the hypothesis that they follow a power law. Um, their impact, though their impact is amplified by the fact that sharing and giving positive feedback that the uh, that affects the algorithms is free in social networks. Um, so there are basically uh, uh, their activity is unbounded. Uh, it's free and thus can be easily gamed. Um, and also their impact is amplified by regular spreaders um, uh, and is affecting the unconscious uh, bystanders as well. Um, so from that modality, we can see the prison bars. Um, 
Uh, so this can be taken to an extreme and that really results in censorship uh, where we kind of take away the freedom to um, to share or the freedom to, um, or we just uh, silence particular groups that are not um, congruent with a general agenda, right? Um, but also, and this is uh, to quote Sharon Bakley, um, you know, we have this problem that science is always focused on people and conditions that are pathological, disturbed, or at best normal. Uh, and you can kind of see it in the past 30 years, uh, there have been about 46,000 scientific studies, studies on depression and an underwhelming 400 on joy. So we thus, with that mode of thinking, we, we risk regulating social networks into rigidity uh, instead of stimulating them into flourishing. We can kind of take away like throw out the baby with the bathwater, take away the good that the social networks have brought us because we, we kind of over-regulate it. Um, and this kind of turns into a whack-a-mole game where you know, the trolls become smarter and we hunt them better and arms race and uh, lots of um, resources wasted. So how do we step outside the box? And, um, we can ask ourselves what contributes to a digital hygiene uh, and uh, can some of the behaviors be automated or encoded into the platforms themselves, right? We can also look at people who do not spread misinformation or um, where misinformation is harmless to them. So it does not change their behavior in harmful ways uh, and look at their features and see if we can amplify them, if we can kind of educate them, right? Uh, to other people. Uh, we can uh, kind of, uh, we can also increase the stakes of the game of sharing um, uh, and make the sharers stakeholders in the effect of their sharing, right? Um, and that includes like transitive trust networks, for example. Um, and we can also indu induce limiters in the networks. So we can create scarcity um, that could possibly in, uh, inhibit mindless sharing. For example, we can have a limit of weekly shares per account, right? So these are you know, different ways of looking at the problem from a different perspective. And then um, we have reductionism. So increased um, focus on a particular facet of a problem that kind of closes us uh, uh, off to the, to the underlying complex system that generates the problem. Um, and an example of thinking like this could be, we must focus on availability and quality of information and fact checking provided by a reputable source so that people can make more informed decisions, right? This is the box. But when we unpack it, when we look a little bit deeper on how people make decisions, um, we see that this box relies on the assumption that uh, we can overrule misinformation with better information by providing fuel, so information for system two, our rational thinking system to follow the Kahneman's logic. And um, to show you, um, this is the system two, this is according to Kahneman, we have two systems, we have intuition and instincts that take about 95% of our decisions and we have a rational thinking that take 5%, right? And also rational thinking is informed by heuristics from intuition and instinct. This is where um, you know, the data that's being put into the rational process um, originates. Um, so we can see that our decision making on average uh, uh, is seldom rational uh, uh, as this process of rational thinking is slow, expensive, and often unpleasant and requires focus and attention. Um, and in fact, decision is, is a multifaceted problem invoking multiple systems. So we have the rational thinking, we have emotions and intuitions that are strongly tied to our biology. Uh, so our cortisol levels will change our intuition, right? Our, our oxytocin levels will change our intuition, right? And we have relations, um, uh, and, and we use empathy and social predictions in our uh, decision making. Um, so um, additionally, what we can see is 
um, is misinformation or false beliefs are not harmful unless they elicit suffering, unless they elicit some response that is harmful. So unless there is violence, risk behavior, self-harm or trans transitory harm where you know, um, this information hurts somebody we spread it to, they're not, um, um, they're not harmful, right? Um, and in that sense, misinformation uh, has to outcompete uh, other decision drivers in our, the way we make decisions to become um, harmful, right? So we can look at things that, that make up for good decision making, like, you know, values, awareness, mindfulness, right? Um, as inhibitors of bad decision making that could be caused by misinformation. It's, you know, it's a, it's a very fluent game between all those driving factors. Um, and also uh, because of that, many people act contrary to their currently heard declared beliefs. Uh, and this is, has to be understood um, when we talk about the effects of uh, misinformation. So, so now we can see the prison bars. Uh, we are mistaking uh, a human for their system too, their rational ego, right? And in fact, many of contemporary social engineering hacks are designed to bypass rationality and kind of just serve the ways of emotion and re relational pressure um, so fighting them on rational, uh, rationality is a lost cause. Um, you know, we can, again, have this uh, sunken cost fallacy. Um, and, and also kind of thinking about, um, you know, credible sources is prone to corruption. Um, so, so we have the, we can kind of see this pri the, these prison bars and now we can ask how to step outside. Um, so we can ask, for example, how do we foster mental postures that reduce suffering and decrease the chance on inflicting suffering onto others, regardless of the information that is currently hold uh, in, you know, in our working memory, right? Um, and how do we help ourselves achieve better emotion regulation so our emotions cannot be hijacked? Uh, and how do neuro biological um, uh, aspects of the human experience like diet, respiration, posture or hormonal profile um, become drivers of that affect emotion regulation and social behavior, right? So we can even ask maybe, you know, good diet and, and, and uh, respiration techniques are more important than media education because they can they change our hormonal profiles and thus our social behavior, right? Um, and you know, and we can we can think about how we kind of basically pro, um, promote those uh, positive regulatory behaviors um, as a way to countermeasure for uh, negative drivers. So yeah, so that's the box. That's uh, uh, and that's some ways of thinking to kind of to spring the discussion to how to sp uh, step outside. But you can also see that that outside of the box, uh, things are getting very complex, right? There are many interactions. There are many additional inquiries. There are many additional um, uh, lines of thought. So we can now ask, how do we navigate um, outside the box? Uh, and some really um, useful uh, tools in that is um, complex systems and complexity theory. Uh, and um, basically complex systems are systems that are composed of many diverse parts that are, that are highly interconnected and capable of adaptation um, and they perform some collective function. Uh, so the key features in the way we view uh, complex systems is the network perspective. Uh, so again, things highly interconnected or feedback loops, they're non-linear. So we have butterfly effects, we have threshold effects, uh, we have disproportionality of input to output is very hard to predict uh, uh, with kind of 
easy causality what's going to result, right? Um, and um, uh, sorry, Nikolai, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, I hate to do this, really, because uh, I feel that this is uh, the beginning of a fascinating uh, dialogue and discussion, but unfortunately, we have to really stick to the schedule because there are um, next panels and the schedule is very packed. And unfortunately, you have just reached your time, okay. uh, as, as I was uh, a little bit afraid of. So um, we still have five minutes, so maybe I will give back the mic to to Isabella uh, uh, about the questions. Yeah. And uh, definitely we will schedule a much longer time to, to discuss everything that you didn't have the time to present. Uh, sure. Maybe I can jump to conclusions for two minutes. Uh, so make it please two minutes. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, just feel free to stop me. Um, so basically, um, we need a well-rounded approach that optimizes the mind, the embodied brain, uh, our relationships, and this approach has to be informed by complex systems. Uh, systems, and we need to look for uh, ways um, to create a mentally thriving society. In the, and it's a matter of global security. So preventative mental health care is a must. Lifelong education and practice um, is a prerequisite for happy and safe society. Um, and we can look at uh, how uh, software and AI can contribute. Um, so it can contribute in scaling those efforts and can contribute in making, um, uh, judging the progress of those efforts uh, more data-driven. Um, it will help us uh, to reverse engineer complex systems. Uh, and it's good at monitoring complex systems because it can take in a multitude of signals um, that uh, humans are, you know, have hard, uh, hardship to follow. And I wanna propose an objective for weaponization is we create a field study where four groups, uh, one is unconditioned, a second is educated about misinformation and ways of reasoning. The third one is enlisted into a personal uh, and relational growth program where we kind of teach mindfulness, positive psychology, physical exercise, and group support and relational practices. And the fourth one is a combination of, two, uh, of the, 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 the second one and the third one. And we see, we kind of uh, see if the hypothesis that um, having a kind of developed uh, grown human that has the tools for, for kind of positive engagement in life is actually vaccine enough uh, to the misfits of uh, misinformation, to the, to the threats of misinformation. And that's it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, the first question uh, is to Dr. Łukasz Kobliński. Um, recent study on language modeling for the prediction of election results in the USA uh, has shown that much accuracy may be gained by retraining language models on the uh, very low of granularity, which uh, with the text data collected on the level of individual states and or counties even. And this might suggest that there is a huge variability of language uh, usage between people and local news outlets, uh, radio, newspapers, combined with local dialects, uh, influence the way we speak and write. What is your opinion on that? In your experience, do you see this phenomenon for languages other than Polish? Well, of course, there's a uh, diversity in, in, in language and uh, what we are doing in, um, in NRP, in, in, in broader um, uh, research uh, concerning linguistics is collecting data um, from um, various uh, um, sources. So um, th these are uh, specific projects concerned, for example, with um, language dialects, um, uh, even in, in Poland conducted to, to um, um, uh, conduct research on, um, on dialects of, of um, Eastern Poland or uh, dialects of, of uh, Southern Poland. And each of these projects um, has its specific um, 
specific collections of, of texts, uh, corpora that, that are analyzed. And uh, what we have to do is even sometimes uh, individually analyze the, the grammar of, of, of the language and the specifics of the language to be able to, uh, to come with, with conclusions that are um, uh, specific for this language group. So um, the idea that, that we can have one universal language model is, is still, uh, I think, uh, many years in front of us. Uh, there are some language models that are trained on, on many languages at once, but um, they are not uh, not really as efficient as uh, as models that are developed specifically for a more focused uh, language group, a single language, or even a dialect. So this will always uh, remain a problem, and and um, um, even more data is probably necessary to, to create single um, models encompassing multiple languages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question to Jan. Um, the main uh, characteristic of a public health uh, intervention is coercion. Don't, don't you think that, uh, don't you think when that uh, the metaphor of information virus and public health measures is something that prevent us from thinking out of the box? Um, can you repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, the main sure. method of intervention is? The main characteristic of a public health intervention is coercion. coercion. Don't you think that when the metaphor of information virus and public health measures is something that prevents us from thinking out of the box? Uh, the method of intervention, yes. Um, uh, actually, I wanted to make a case for, um, mm, uh, for exploring things like culture design, where uh, culture design focuses um, on uh, fostering uh, certain postures uh, in, um, in the people that allow them to um, more effectively uh, adapt. And, uh, and uh, I invite uh, those, um, you know, kind of asking that question to explore the field of culture design where it focuses on kind of behaviors of individual agents and the way they kind of come into uh, relationships and educating them, not coercing, coercing but educating them uh, into a way where they can uh, self-adapt and self-educate in the future and self-govern. So that is, um, that is a very interesting field, um, emerging field um, on the kind of in between uh, complexity theory, kind of social evolution and social intervention and, uh, and governance. Um, yeah, and also there is a request from our attendees. Is it possible to share this interactive list that you shown, Jan? Um, yeah, I think, I think it will be possible. And I think we are also gonna record a full version of the talk. I'm sorry, I just got carried away uh, thinking about it. Uh, but um, so, so uh, I'll be happy to share it. Um, please request me via email and, um, and we're also gonna record. Um, yeah, it would be great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And not to irritate uh, the head of the project, Dr. Piasecki, because we are already eating three minutes of the next session. So thank you all for participating in this uh, fascinating discussion. This is a conversation definitely that will continue throughout the project and uh, will uh, spawn many new ideas. So thank you very much. And probably you can move to the next panel. Thank yes, you thank you very much. Don't forget to log to the next session or just to click the next uh, live stream.